Australia's education industry is booming. Australia was the ideal place for me. I love this place. It's now our third largest export behind iron ore and coal. Australia is one of the most successful international educators, particularly in its universities, in the world. Universities are admitting foreign students in record numbers. How do you think universities view international students? Look, um, of course, they are the cash cows. There is no doubt about it. But there's another story behind the success. How frequently are universities waiving English language requirements? I would say that it's not all universities, but there are, de there are definitely uh, large numbers of universities still which waive English language requirements. Admitting students who don't have the right prerequisites or correct language capabilities is setting them up for failure. This is just not what a university should do. That's not what education is about. I was getting large piles of folders with academic misconduct cases in them and the numbers just kept going up and up and up and so I started to ask people what's going on. I think it's a train wreck. I think it's coming and it's coming hard and the income and government's going to have to deal with some pretty serious welfare concerns. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate how Australia's higher education system is being undermined and we reveal the risks that some universities are taking to cash in on foreign students. It's orientation week at Australia's oldest university. This year, more than a third of Sydney University's students will come from overseas. Sydney, uh, it's a beautiful place, plus it's very like multicultural, a lot of diversity. You get a good exposure globally, so that's why I selected Sydney. Plus it's near to my place, like more near to India, so that's why. Around the country, universities make more than $7 billion a year from international student fees. The bulk of that money goes to the education and the running of the university to make that education successful and of high quality. And it goes in part to support the whole endeavour of universities, so it also supports what we do more generally and universities in Australia do education and research, and so those international students are contributing to the whole fabric of the university and its success in the future. Universities have suffered more than $2 billion in funding cuts. Our public funding has been contracting at a furious rate. So universities in that situation do two things. They cut costs and they seek income streams. Obviously the income stream that is most commonly sought is international students. Uh, my name is Jan. And um, when did you arrive in Australia? Uh, I mean, maybe the day before yesterday, yeah. And what are you studying here? Uh, the interaction design. Interaction design, yeah. See the wonderful city. Yeah, it's charming, yeah. And the weather is uh, <laughs> uh, a little hard, but um, but it's uh, uh, the sunshine is really good. Yeah. Not today. Yeah, <laughs> but it's cool today. It's cool today. Yeah. <laughs> Most of Australia's foreign students come from China, but in the last three years, there's been a massive increase in students coming from South Asia. My name is Shatij. I'm from India as well, uh, Jaipur. So I'm studying Master of IT and IT Management here. Since 2015, the number of student enrolments from India has more than doubled. 
From neighbouring Nepal, growth has jumped by a staggering 132%. Those numbers are just huge red flags around the concern that we should be having for the students themselves, but for those who are influencing those decisions to come to Australia. So whether it's the agents or whether it's the institutions themselves and their ability to determine the actual credibility of those students and the long-term outcomes that those students are, are likely or even able to achieve. International students are sold on a promise of being part of an Australian lifestyle at a university campus. It's just the best place to come, I feel. Coming to uni makes me happy. But the reality for some is very different. What are the classes like so far? Are there many Australian students? Um, um, no. no. <laughs> we have more um, international students. There are more uh, Sri Lankans, Indians. Nepalese. And, uh, Nepalese. So were you a bit disappointed? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> because we are not able to uh, communicate or uh, get in touch with local people. Mm -hmm. And moreover, uh, interacting with the localites makes it easy to understand the Australian culture. Regional University Southern Cross has set up city campuses catering exclusively to foreign students. If there isn't a diversity of students in the class, it really impacts their future career as well on how they want to grow in that particular field. Because people come to Australia to have that Australian experience and it's very important to have that balance of Australian and international students. Otherwise, they wouldn't have this Australian experience, you know. Central Queensland University also has city campuses for overseas students. Uh, I'm enrolled in Master of Information Technology. And why did you choose Central Queensland University? Um, I, there are a lot of universities, but uh, a friend of mine suggested me you could go for CQ. It's good. Um, you could uh, do your career better. It, has, it shows you a lot of opportunities. And do you know that it's based in Queensland in another state? No. No one is the domestic, domestic student in our classes. So they're all international? No, they're all there. I think lots of them are from India. Lots of students. Lots of people from India? Yeah. yeah. Are you disappointed? Yeah, a little yeah, bit. A little bit. <laughs> but there is no internet, uh, local student domestic. So okay. we can't communication with them and... So can get any experience, experience. Local, uh, local culture. How do you think universities view international students? Look, um, of course, they are the cash cows. There is no doubt about it. Australia's student visa system underwent a major overhaul in 2016. The changes simplified the process and gave universities the power to assess the suitability of students before they were granted visas. Higher education institutions came to the government a number of years back and said, we're of good standing and you should be able to trust our ability to recruit the right kinds of students. We should be able to assess the English capability of the student. The immigration department doesn't need to be involved in that. Um, and that was largely accepted by the government. Well, that was a very positive set of changes that we're happy to have. It's probably meant as well that universities have a bit more work to do <laughs> in terms of the streamlined visa processing because more of the work that was involved in um, being responsible for uh, making sure that visa conditions are met came to universities. The universities now had responsibility for checking whether applicants were genuine students. This is where there was a little bit of a conflict of interest because the university interest is in getting the student. But here, uh, the process required the university to do some of that other role. Ravi Lochan Singh represents the Indian education agents who are paid by universities to bring students to Australia. Sometimes when you put in a visa application, you could get a visa grant within minutes or within a very short period of time. And that means there has not been a human um, interference in the visa process. The system by itself has granted a visa and it happens quite a bit. And is that a good system? I don't know. Because in the recent years, we've had students with uh, uh, very poor English landing up in Australia. 
which wouldn't have happened earlier had there been a human element in the visa process. Under the new system, universities can waive their own English entry standards and accept students who haven't taken an independent English test. How frequently are universities waiving English language requirements? I would say that it's not all universities, but there are, there are definitely um, large numbers of universities still which waive English language requirements. There are higher education standards that we have to adhere to in order to be accredited as universities and they are administered by the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency and it actually reviews us against those on a regular cycle. At the start of the academic year in Western Australia, international students have come to the governor's residence for an official welcome. We have virtually every country that sends students here represented in our own population. That and the fact that universities are first class. WA wants to increase the number of international students to 100,000 by 2025. The quality of the education you'll get here in Western Australia is as good as any you'll get anywhere in the world. The state's top uni bosses are here to welcome the latest international student recruits. The thing I like most about studying at Murdoch is the professionalism of the courses. All the Murdoch University in Perth has an ambitious strategy to increase international student numbers. Two years ago, it was struggling with a $5 million deficit. At staff meetings, we were regularly told that our financial position was unsustainable and that change was necessary. So there's very little doubt uh, that uh, the growth in uh, international student numbers uh, was a desired outcome to rectify the budget position. Hi, my name is Suzanne Smith and I'm the Director of International at Murdoch University in Perth, Western Australia. Murdoch's International Director Suzanne Smith was recruited in 2017 to drive up the number of international students. Her mission took her to India and Nepal. Murdoch University and Perth have some great opportunities for you. Um, this video appeared on the Facebook page of Murdoch University's Indian student recruitment agent, OECC. One of the key markets Murdoch was targeting was the Punjab region in India, where OECC had a number of offices. Andrew Durston is the former head of the Immigration Department's Visa Integrity Division in India. He's now a private consultant to the industry. For Australia, the, the Punjab still represents um, a high-risk environment. There are still many very good students and well-qualified students from, from Punjab as, as other states. However, it's had a, a long history of sending its residents out overseas to seek residence in first world countries. So a long history of doing that and there's a strong industry within the state, and there are a few other states in India that have this problem, who will use whatever means they can to achieve a visa outcome. Murdoch's push to recruit students from the Punjab started ringing alarm bells. A senior higher education advisor sent a warning to Murdoch's admission staff. I would not recommend OECC as they rely heavily on Punjab. The application that you will get will be from the sub-agents who are from Punjab. The process is also not in place. Another warning came from a former immigration official. I have also heard from a credible source that OECC have been selling offer letters in Punjab. If this were to happen with a Murdoch offer letter, it would gravely jeopardise the reputation that Murdoch University are trying to build. Extracting a fee for an offer letter sounds very odd because firstly, uh, the universities compensate the agents for the services that are, that are offered. Now what happens sometimes is that certain education agents might double dip. That means they might charge a fee to a student too in addition to charging the university. 
some of Murdoch's admission staff were also concerned about the quality of the students OECC was targeting. One staff member wrote, The Facebook page is quite telling in their modus operandi. I have taken screenshots of some of the posts, which appear to target students whom are married, previously refused, and low level of English. They passed on warnings to the Deputy Vice-Chancellor International. OECC specifically target high-risk students with few other options. Their business model is apparently to extract a fee from students for offer letters. We thought you should be aware of the outcome of the due diligence. OECC immigration, the name you can trust. Despite the warnings, in 2017, OECC was granted a one-year contract with Murdoch. Admissions staff started receiving requests to admit some students with lower English standards. Could we please provide this student with a direct letter of offer? The Deputy Vice-Chancellor International has approved waiving the English. Attached is a list of English applications I've looked at with a view to see if there are some waivers we can make. The admission staff were worried. I think we really need to sort this constant stream of English waivers out and simply amend the entry requirements if that's the direction Murdoch University wants, needs to go. They sounded the alarm to university management. This is a Bachelor of Business applicant who has previously had two visa refusals due to genuine temporary entrant and fraudulent claims. We now are providing a full offer with an English waiver. We have had situations where applicants have not met entry through one agent and then subsequently have shopped around to OECC and then been offered admission. This sort of operation poses not only a compliance risk, but a reputational risk to the university. Four Corners has learned admissions staff started a secret dossier with the details of more than 200 student applications which they believed did not meet the university's standards. They were worried some were not genuine students and others had scored below the university's English requirements. Admitting students who don't have the right prerequisites or correct language capabilities is setting them up for failure. This is just not what a university should do. That's not what education is about. In January 2018, a WA government official warned Murdoch that lowering English standards could allow the use of student visas as a backdoor entry into Australia. I've learned from my sources that Murdoch have become very generous and will be waiving off English language requirement. They will use your English waiver just to get a visa. Intention will be something else. A couple of WA institutions did the same but burned their hands. Murdoch is not alone in recruiting students with English scores below their published entry requirements. Four Corners has obtained evidence showing the University of Tasmania and Southern Cross University are also advertising English waivers. There are students onshore in Australia who have not managed to complete even the first semester of study and have managed to come here on a visa. And then after a semester, they're legally allowed to move. So, so in a way, uh, uh, I, I believe it's a shortcut into Australia. So it's an immigration workaround? I think there's a loophole here. And that loophole is known to uh, all parties. No, no university today can say that they are not aware of uh, what's happening. At Murdoch University, the recruitment drive continued. Hi ladies, I'm happy to approve overtime or additional support, as it's important to our future as a university to maximise our numbers to try and reduce our deficit. At the start of last year, more than 680 international students arrived at Murdoch's Perth campus, a 92% increase on the previous year. 
two-thirds of the students were from India. Staff quickly saw the consequences. So that's your first assignment. Many students seem to be unable to understand instructions or understand the material that was put in front of them. And there were also cases of students who apparently didn't understand how to use a computer in any sophisticated way. So even logging on was a struggle for some students. Um, and there were also stories about students not recognising what a USB stick was and other incidents which you would not expect to see from students who have an IT degree. I spent five years as a consultant. These three Murdoch academics are so concerned about what's been happening at the university, they've decided to go public. I'm not against international students. In fact, I'm for international students, but I have concerns about how we're dealing with it. Associate Professor Gerd Schroeder-Turk is the staff-elected representative to the university's governing body, known as the Senate. I've got very serious uh, ethical concerns about the way the practices uh, that we're applying in the international student recruitment space. And I'm concerned both about the welfare of the students and the well-being of the students, uh, as well as about the in uh, academic integrity uh, or the problems related to academic integrity that result from this. Came from the farm. Dr Duncan Farrow and Professor Graham Hawking both investigate student so, academic misconduct. Uh, By mid last year, they saw a sudden increase. No, not just an I was getting large piles of folders with academic misconduct cases in them and the numbers just kept going up and up and up and so I started to ask people what's going on. It was clear that a lot of these misconduct cases were from one cohort of students, this particular group of Indian students. A lot of the cases were plagiarism or collusion, which is copying from each other and then submitting separate assignments. Their level of English, particularly written English, was very poor. And in some cases, they seemed to not understand the process that they were going through in terms of this academic misconduct. Four Corners can reveal there were more than 100 misconduct cases in the School of Engineering and IT in first semester last year. Many were from the Masters of IT course. Over 60% of the students failed at least one of their four units that they'd taken, and 14% had passed no units at all. How unusual is that? For a postgraduate degree, for an international cohort of students, it's extremely unusual. You would normally expect to pass just about everybody. The impact was also felt by domestic students. If I was being, you know, Daniel Manganaro was enrolled in the Masters of IT at Murdoch in 2018. That money that you spent. At the end of that first week, we have our tutorials, first tutorials of the week, and I get in and we sit down and we get put into groups and we're told, you know, this is your group for the semester. You're going to be working with these people for the entire semester. And it was me and eight internationals, students, all from uh, the same place, and they were all speaking their native language to each other. And I was sitting there, I was like, oh, this is going to be really bad. And then, but like, yeah. and After the first week, he decided to drop out. When I was doing my undergraduate, we did have a couple of international students come through, and I worked with them, and they were absolutely amazing. I don't think there's a vetting process anymore of like getting those international students in. They have a main problem is uh, the language barrier. Daxian Kitson and his friend Nancy studied another Murdoch IT course last year. Uh, some of the students, uh, I really worried about them struggling because. Uh, like, for example, in one week of semester, I had to explain to my uh, group of international students what the word policy meant. And I, I was worried at that point. I'm like, you know, these people are studying a master's in IT. That's a very difficult thing to do. It requires a lot of, you know, critical and academic thinking in English. And if you don't have a firm grasp on the language, you know, I was a bit worried about how to progress moving forward in their course. When we have to meet a group with others, domestic students and the international students, the most problem is the communication gap. How would you describe how the English was for some of the students? 
some are best, some are better, and some are worst. I would do my best to make sure that the team uh, would understand the topic each week and then I would get them to send to me what they had written and uh, I would try and rephrase it into more readable English. The academics say welfare issues have increased as students struggle with a multitude of challenges. I get the sense that there's a high expectation from home for them being sent here and that there's general hardships of being separated from family. Many of them are separated from partners, some of them from children. Some of them, of course, don't have a great English, uh, so they're not finding it difficult to live outside of the university and just get on with normal sorts of things that we take for granted. For a great many international students, their entire family's financial future is invested in succeeding in their education. And when they're under pressure, the failure is just not an option for them. In April 2018, an internal staff newsletter reported the number of emergency cases at Murdoch's counselling service had more than doubled in a year. The counselling service were trying to take on more people because they felt they were understaffed, because they were having a lot of students come and talk to them about these sorts of issues. Sort of start to be in an impossible place where you have to balance your concern for the student, for the student mental health, the student welfare, the student well-being, and indeed the student happiness, with the requirements of course, of, of, of course upholding the academic standards and the academic integrity of your course. During the middle of the year break, I was sitting in the library doing some work, having a coffee, and I looked outside and there was a growing line of students, clearly from India, and it was the new enrolments for the second semester. And my heart sank because I, I was thinking, well, there were major issues, and now we have more, and I, I'm not sure, maybe they were all fine, but I was very worried about what would happen after that. Um, and I was quite depressed about what the future held for those students. I do get a little bit annoyed with people... Who Last year, Murdoch staff lodged a series of complaints to their superiors. Between me and my colleagues, we have raised concerns about these issues in almost all relevant university committees. I can only at this point in time assure you that I have raised my concerns in all the forums that uh, I was able to raise them in. I'm putting at risk that. So I sent a letter outlining all the issues and I was told that there had been no change to the entrance requirements, that the number of waivers of our entrance requirements was like three or four, um, and, that there, and that therefore there was actually no problem with the international students that I need to worry about. A few weeks later, we, the staff were sent an email saying there was no problem with Indian students that it was a problem of uh, staff not understanding the cultural difference and that we should all be perhaps doing cultural awareness training, which is more than mildly offensive to people who've been teaching international students for 20 or 30 years. I was having trouble reconciling a statement that says there's no problem because there's been no change in their entrance requirements with the actual students that we were dealing with on the ground. Associate Professor Schroeder Turk lodged a detailed complaint to the university's chancellor. There has been a preliminary review into some matters that included international student recruitment. And as I understand that uh, review was conducted by a barrister and as the vice chancellor has informed us, that review found no adverse findings against any staff member at Murdoch University. I think this element of whether our practices are ethical or not is a far harder question to investigate and it's one that requires a much more honest discourse uh, than the question whether or not there is a, a, formal, dis, a formal misconduct. We held a, a meeting of members in uh, September 2018 uh, to discuss the issues around international students when we became aware that Murdoch was conducting a preliminary review uh, and over 100 members came to that meeting. And they sp spoke about the things that 
that we all know happen with international students. Uh, a very significant increase in the number of students, many of the students with inadequate English skills to be able to adequately pass the units, many with cultural adjustment problems, and um, staff right across the university at workload, the workload point where they can't provide the help that they need. In a statement, Murdoch University said it maintains admissions standards consistent with national standards for international students, along with English language requirements in line with those across the sector. It said a small number of students required guidance and additional support to maintain the university's academic conduct standards and that this was fewer than 0.5% of all our students. The university said its international students are equipped and supported for their studies. Academics at other universities are also worried about the impact of the growing number of foreign students. Some of the uh, international students do research and some of them are, are quite good. But the sort of course, the course that I was teaching was part of the master's course. And I just felt that these people weren't up to it and the university didn't care. That's really not the proper way of... Lecturer Charles Reichman founded the postgraduate construction law course at Swinburne University. Over perhaps 60 to 65% were overseas students and as the number of overseas students increased, plagiarism increased. What do you think was driving that? Um, what was driving it is that people were uh, recruited to the course and they weren't capable of doing the work that was required for the course, so they saw that as a way out. After he saw the number of plagiarism cases rise to unprecedented levels in 2018, he raised the matter with university management. There was one student who, in my view, I had absolutely no doubt at all it was plagiarism, and he said to me, look, this student denies it. Could you mark this paper? And I said, no, I'm not going to mark this paper. And uh, he asked me again, I said, look, I can't. I can't mark a paper where I had absolutely no doubt that it's plagiarism. So you've received this email there praising you for your work. And Less than two weeks before the start of semester this year, Charles Reichman was told he wasn't needed anymore. What was your reaction to that? Uh, it made me feel very, very disappointed, but in a way I also felt that I would be expecting this since I raised the issue of plagiarism. They paid a lot of money to do a course. They weren't told, look, you need these skills to be able to do these courses. So they found themselves what do I do? I can't cope with this. And why do you think the university wasn't keen to address the problems? They'll lose a lot of customers. In a statement, Swinburne University strongly denied it condones plagiarism. It said Mr Reichman's departure followed a course review and was unrelated to the concerns he had raised. So in terms of attracting students, in terms of retaining students, in terms of sustaining the growth of international students, universities will do whatever they need to do. It will be a very good thing to actually invite industry people because... They... Associate Professor Sharif Asaba is the founding director of the Masters of Business program at RMIT University in Melbourne. That you mentioned soft skills. He set up this group for international business students because he was worried they were isolated from the Australian community. That when you were studying at a postgraduate level, 95% of people whom you interact would be from your own countries or maybe not, not exactly Australia. Australia? I think to have international students in Australia is a delight as an academic, 
it is a uh, it is good for us because we learn a lot of things from them this is published by the australian government associate professor asaba says he's seeing an increasing number of international students struggle many of those students still cannot speak or write or communicate well enough within the classroom and with their teachers as well so we want students and sometimes we don't really put a lot of preconditions on them and um, we see the variation within the classroom that some students are good some students are not so good and as teachers it is challenging to manage that class some students are under enormous pressure they have pressure for money because they need to do work and some of them cannot even complete their programs complete their degrees and that is a worry for themselves and for their family it is a stressful time for them and those kind of stress could um, take them to any end for some students the pressure to succeed has become too much in january this year a victorian coroner's court investigation found 27 international students had died by suicide in six years in that state alone. When students mention in emails self-harm, when students open up over issues of extreme financial distress, when students tell you about their concerns of not having their family with them, then you do get very worried. And uh, young people, well, all people, but young people who are out of their comfort zone are vulnerable. And of course, you get worried. Of course, why do they struggle? They, are, they struggle because either they don't have the financial means to study here and live here, or they struggle because they don't have the English skills to live here. And in both these cases, with the lower um, uh, assessment level of universities, those universities were able to waive or apply their own yardsticks. Universities around the country are celebrating their success. Thank you, Sabra. Australia is on track to become the second most popular destination for international students in the world. Why is being incredibly successful at what you do a problem? I don't think we should be apologetic about being incredibly successful. There is overall evidence that, in fact, the system holds up. It has good entry standards, it has good standards in terms of what it takes to successfully complete a degree, and there is evidence that we are admitting students who are able to succeed at about the rate that is really right for, for having a high quality education system in Australia. The standards agency, TEXA, told Four Corners there's little evidence to suggest compliance problems with English language requirements. There are students who won't be able to write an assignment on their own. Uh, there are students uh, uh, who would study into a program uh, wouldn't understand anything. I feel uh, a little lost as to what they will get at the end of the year. What's going to happen? They will fail subjects, and what's going to happen in the end is they'll fail the program, they'll become non-complying. There are too many students coming without the requisite capabilities. Whether that's English, whether that's academics, whether that's financial capacity to maintain themselves in Australia. Um, the tolerance level is too low, in my opinion. I think uh, the credibility of the program itself, um, the, the international brand of, of Australian education, has to set the benchmark fairly high, um, such that uh, you know, very few come in who are not qualified and credible students. In two years, Murdoch University has turned a $5 million deficit into a $15 million surplus. I would say at the moment the university, and by that I mean the senior people in the university, are riding a wave of, um, not euphoria, but happiness about the, the income being generated by these international students. 
Towards the end of 2018, staff were informed that a bonus payment of $1,000 would be made to all eligible staff. That statement made it clear that this was due to the improved uh, financial position of the university, and it was also made clear that this was as a reward for loyalty. I have expressed my moral concerns about uh, our practices in international recruitment, which are the biggest driver in our improved budget position, uh, and I also don't like being uh, rewarded for loyalty. So I uh, declined that payment. So what are you all putting at risk to speak out about this publicly today? Well, ultimately, I think I'm putting my career at risk. So um, the potential exists to be to lose your job as a result of this. I've decided that for me, in this case, you know, the integrity of Murdoch University and the integrity of the Australian tertiary education system is more important than where I earn my money. Tertiary education is really about educating uh, the next generation of students who will make a difference to society. And this is a very sensitive product, education. It is one that's about bringing up young people and preparing them for making big contributions to society. And we need to be very careful in that space to make sure that we do it in an ethical and moral way and in one that's best for everyone.